So this is a little embarrassing to admit, but I'm going to go ahead and confess it. As a pastor, today is one of the two most challenging Sundays of the year for me, and the reason is because I can't surprise you with anything. You already know how the story ends, don't you? But it's also one of my favorite Sundays of the year, and it's because I get to clear up what I think is a common misunderstanding and misreception about Easter. See, here's the deal. Easter isn't religious. Easter is historical. Now, I know for many of you, you have viewed Easter, and you have been told that Easter is a religious holiday. And for some of you, you don't believe it's historical at all, or you're not sure, how could somebody come out of a tomb? I just don't know if I can trust that. I don't know if I can believe that. Or some of you have decided, there's no way to believe that. This is just a story that's made up. It's a fictional tale with a good moral uh, idea or good moral teaching at the end of it. And I get that. I hope by the end today that I have piqued your curiosity enough that you'll at least explore the evidence a little more behind this idea that Easter is historical. But let me explain to you why Easter isn't religious. See, all throughout the centuries, religions have been created to fill the gap between the unexplainable and the undeniable. This is what religions always did. You go back centuries and centuries and you begin to study world religions, and the weather would change, people would get sick, some battles would be won, some battles would be lost, and people couldn't explain it. There was no clear why as to why this happened and that happened and that changed and that changed. And so you know what they would do? They would create religions that filled the gap and explained the unexplainable but undeniable. And that worked for a while until, and you know what happened, science began to arise and we began to get more answers and then science filled the gap. And when it did, it dismantled religion. As science filled the gap, there was no need for the religious explanations anymore. For example, where does lightning come from? Well, if you went back hundreds of years and you asked the Vikings, they would say Thor. If you asked the Greeks, they would say Zeus. Science came along and we all know now, oh no, there's a much more plausible explanation and the sky gods disappeared as science arose. You go back centuries and you start asking people, well, what do you do when somebody's sick? And you know what they would do? They would call a witch doctor because they were convinced that person was sick because they must have an evil spirit, a demon of some kind. So let's bring in the witch doctor and let's do all of these crazy and sometimes very painful things to these people in hopes of getting rid of the evil spirits. And then science arose and they discovered this thing called germs. And now when somebody gets sick, we don't call a witch doctor, do we? We just get an antibiotic and it solves the whole thing. Now, the reason I don't believe Easter is religious is because the Easter story was not designed or created to fill any gap between the unexplainable and the undeniable. I believe Easter was historical because it's an event that actually happened, that started a movement that we now call Christianity, which leads us to the question that all of us, myself included, have asked at some point, and some of you are asking today. The question is simply, how? How can anyone believe in Jesus' resurrection? How can anyone believe that a dead man walked out of a tomb under his own power? I think that's a great question. I think it's a question that deserves to be asked, and I think it's a question that deserves some really solid answers. So let me explain to you real quickly why Christians believe in the resurrection. We do not, let me say this again, we do not believe in the resurrection because the Bible says so. No, it's way better than that. Here's why we believe. We believe in the resurrection because there is verifiable, undeniable evidence that this historical event actually happened. And what I want to do today is this. I want to give you just a little bit of that evidence. I don't have time to give it all to you. There's a mountain of evidence if you begin to explore it for yourself. But I want to give you a little bit, and I hope it piques your curiosity enough that you'll dive in and begin to explore the rest of the evidence for yourself. So, when it comes to evidence, one of the pieces I want to introduce to you today actually doesn't start in the Bible at all. It starts completely outside of the Bible. It is, I want to introduce you to a man by the name of Flavius Josephus. That name has some drip, doesn't it? Next time you're having a son, there's your great name. Flavius Josephus. It just rolls off the tongue. Anyway, Flavius Josephus was a Jew who became the historian and the biographer for Emperor Domitian in the Roman Empire. It is a fascinating story how this Jew became the biographer and the historian for Domitian, but we'll talk about that another time. The thing you need to know is that Josephus is most well known for this massive work he wrote called The Antiquities of the Jews. 
Josephus was not a follower of Jesus, but he writes about Jesus. In book 18 of his works, in chapter 3, section 3, I want to read you a little bit about what Josephus writes about Jesus. Here's what he says. At this time, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. He's talking about at this time in the first century in the nation of Israel. His conduct was good and was known to be virtuous. And Josephus, again, not a follower of Jesus, a Roman historian tells us, many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate, we've all heard of Pilate. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. Let me pause right there for just a second. I think this flabbergasted Josephus. This amazed him. He couldn't understand it because, remember, Josephus had a front row seat to all of the persecution, to all the pain, to all the suffering, to all the deaths that Christians experienced because they wouldn't recant what they had seen and heard and experienced with Jesus. So he's writing this and he's thinking, I I still can't understand it. They never abandoned following him in spite of all they endured. He continues as he writes and he says, "They uh, they reported that he had appeared, Jesus had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion. This is what these Jesus followers said and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was, perhaps, the Messiah concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. Now, why would Jewish people, think about this, why would Jewish people believe that Jesus had died and then come back to life? It was not because they were superstitious. Jewish people were not superstitious. As a matter of fact, many Jewish people didn't even believe in an afterlife. And they didn't believe it because Jesus' closest followers had somehow fooled them. Now think about this. How do a group of guys who had no influence and no power in first century Jewish world create a story that is so compelling and convincing that it spreads around the whole world? Not only that, why would they create a story? Why would they make up a story that ended up getting them killed? This is why so many of them were martyrs. Not because they wouldn't stop teaching the teachings of Jesus. They were martyrs because they wouldn't stop telling people what they had seen and heard and experienced. Specifically, they kept telling people, we saw him crucified, we saw him buried. And then we saw him alive. You see, the reason that so many people in the first century believed that Jesus had come back to life was because it was so easy to investigate. Now think about this. In the first century... All the evidence was there for them to check out themselves. Now, if you're thinking, well, I don't know how good of of evidence an empty tomb is. No, no, no. They did not believe Jesus had risen from the dead because there was an empty tomb. They believed he had risen from the dead because he had appeared to over 500 people at different places and at different times. 500 independent accounts of, yes, we saw him crucified, But yes, I talked to him. Yes, I had breakfast with him on the beach. Yes, I walked and journeyed from one town to another with him. Yes, we saw him with our own eyes. There were over 500 different people. So in the first century, all you had to do to investigate it was go to one person after another person after another person and just ask them questions, hear their stories, put them all together. And it was convincing proof. It was convincing evidence. Not that something religious had happened, but that something historical had happened, that this event had actually taken place. Now, in what we call the New Testament, there are four independent accounts of Jesus' life. And in all four of these accounts, they talk about some of these people who saw Jesus alive after he died. And what is so interesting about it are the types of people they mention. They are certainly not the types of people you would expect them to mention if they were trying to make up a story. So I want to read you a couple of these accounts, and I want you to do the best you can not to think of it as I'm reading from the Bible, because at this point when these were written, the Bible didn't exist the way we know it. I just want you to imagine, because this is what's happening, that I'm reading to you from a couple independent historical first century accounts of what these people said they saw and heard and experienced. I want to start with Matthew. Just as Jesus is dying on the cross... We're going to pick up the story, and Matthew tells us something remarkable happens. Here's what he says. As evening approached, he says, there was a rich man. Now, this is going to be important in just a second. There was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph 
who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Now, we know a little uh, background about Joseph from some other writings. And what we know is he was actually a Pharisee who was one of the most powerful religious leaders in the nation of Israel at the time. He was part of the Sanhedrin, which was the most powerful Jewish ruling body or Jewish council in the entire nation. And the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, that was a group of people who had had Jesus condemned. So it is so strange to see Joseph... And in some of the other accounts, it tells us Nicodemus, his friend Nicodemus as well, who was also a Pharisee, these two guys show up in the story at the death of Jesus. And you wouldn't expect it, but something had happened, and we don't know entirely what, but something had happened that caused these two men, in spite of the fact that all of their peers wanted Jesus crucified, these two men had a different perspective. And they chose to risk everything they had to step out, and they became a part of the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, the other interesting thing about this to me is on the other side of the resurrection, we find out that many of the Pharisees, that many of Joseph and Nicodemus' peers actually began to follow Jesus. That's really hard to explain apart from a resurrection, but we'll talk about that another day. Joseph steps out not because he thinks Jesus is going to walk out of a tomb one day. Joseph steps out because he just feels like, you know what, this is such an injustice. Jesus didn't deserve this. And here's what Matthew tells us he did. Going to Pilate, this is why him having the power he had and the wealth he had is so significant because nobody else could have done this but someone with that much wealth and power. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body to be taken off the cross. And Pilate ordered that it be given to Joseph. Matthew goes on, tells us, Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Now, that just covers over a lot of details that the readers in the first century would have known. But what Joseph did, along with his friend Nicodemus, is they took about 75 pounds worth of spices, and they placed them on Jesus' body, and then they wrapped him in cloth, holding those spices against his body. So he did that, and then he placed Jesus' body in his own new tomb, in Joseph's own new tomb, that he had cut out of the rock. And then Matthew gives us this detail. He says he rolled a big stone. Big stone is an understatement. This stone would have weighed probably a one to two tons. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and he went away. And then Matthew gives us this interesting detail that seems completely out of place. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. They're just sitting there watching. They watched Joseph and Nicodemus finish up the burial of Jesus. They watch him roll the stone over the entrance, and then everybody walks away. All hope is gone. They have decided it is game over. Now, the reason these women are mentioned is really significant, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But the thing I don't want you to miss is that in this moment, in this moment, no one was expecting a resurrection. Nobody expected Nobody three days later. Nobody expected it. They were all headed home or they were all hiding in fear. Now, Friday night passes, Saturday passes, and they believe it's game over. And then Sunday morning, Luke, who wrote another independent account of Jesus' life, Luke tells us what takes place on Sunday morning. But what took place was not expected by anyone who's a part of the story. Here's how he tells us it went. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women, what women? Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, a few other women who he's going to name in a minute, the ones who sat there and watched Jesus buried. These women took the spices that they had prepared, and they went to the tomb, which raises an interesting question. Why would they be headed back to the tomb with more spices when they watched Nick and Joe already take care of the burial? Well, Answer's pretty simple. They did this for the very same reason that when I'm folding clothes at our house, my wife comes along right behind me and she fixes them all when I'm done. They were certain. They had watched. They were like, those guys didn't prepare that body right. I'm going to go back and do it. Can you imagine? Think about this. Can you imagine how deeply you must love someone to go into a tomb after three days and to reapply all the proper procedures to get them buried correctly? That's how much these women love Jesus. I actually, as I was studying for this, I walked over to my wife one day and I said, hey, I've got a question for you. Don't, don't ask for any context. I just want to know, 
if I died and they buried me and you found out that they hadn't properly buried me in the casket and put me in the ground, uh, three days later, would you, would you have them dig it up and would you fix me? I'm not going to tell you what she said, but let's just say I'm not holding my breath, okay? I mean, this was, this was unusual, wasn't it? This was a deep-seated love. But again, they're not showing up expecting to find an empty tomb. They're showing up expecting to fix the mistakes of Nicodemus and Joseph and just move forward. Luke continues. He says this. They found, the women found, the stone rolled away. Because as they're going, they're thinking, we got to find somebody to move that stone. It's too heavy for us. They get there and they see it's rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And please don't miss this. They didn't look at each other at that point and say, he's alive. They looked at each other and thought, oh no, somebody took his body. And then Luke tells us this happened. While they were wondering about this, who's taken his body? Suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now we discovered these are actually angels. And Luke tells us that in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, these angels, said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? To which I'm sure they thought, that's not what we're doing. We're looking for the dead among the dead. They continue on. He is not here, they told the women. He's risen. Remember, this is so important. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Remember he predicted all this was going to happen? And Luke tells us, then they remembered his words. Then they remembered. And they looked at each other, and I'm kind of reading between the lines, but I think they said, oh, man, we remember him saying that. We just didn't believe him. We remembered him saying that. We didn't think it was literal. I mean, who would expect somebody to walk out of a tomb on their own pow- under their own power? Luke continues, he says this, When they came back from the tomb, when the women did, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. Who are the eleven? Jesus' twelve closest disciples minus Judas. So they go back to Peter, John, James, Matthew, Thomas, all of those guys. And they tell all these things to the eleven and to all the other followers of Jesus who are hiding with them. And then Luke gives us this detail. He says it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, who these people knew, we don't know, but they knew, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. Again, he's mentioning all these women. Why is that significant? Well, we're about to find out. Because look at the response of these men when they hear the story. But they, the men, did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. In other words, these women go back and say, he's alive And they looked back at him and said, you're smoking something. There's no way. They didn't buy into it at all. Now, here's why this is so significant, okay? And if you tuned out, tuned back in, if you drifted, you know, refocus for just a second. Here's why this is so significant. How do you know that this story wasn't made up? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but I want to tell you two real quick. First of all, in the first century, women were given no credibility in a court of law. Women's testimony, if you will, women's accounts of something that happened were not considered when they were deciding what was true and what was false. So let me ask you this. Why in the world, in all four independent accounts of the death and resurrection of Jesus, why in the world would all of these accounts tell us that the very first witnesses of the empty tomb, the very first people to see Jesus alive, the primary witnesses of what happened, why do all four accounts say they're women? If you're trying to make up a story in the first century and get people to believe it, you're not going to make women the primary and first witnesses. You're just not going to do it. But all four accounts tell us women were the first ones to find the empty tomb. Women were the first ones to see Jesus alive. Why would they write that? Because it happened that way. There is no other explanation. Now, here's another reason why you can trust these accounts. These guys who wrote this, Matthew, he's one of them that that said, this is nonsense when the women told him. Mark, who got his account from Peter, Peter was one of them who said it's nonsense. John, who wrote about this, was one of them that said it's nonsense. Here's one of the reasons you can trust these accounts. Because the disciples documented their own disbelief. Think about that. 
These guys did not write themselves into the story as heroes. I'm going to be honest. If I'm making up a story and I'm trying to get you to believe it, I'm going to be the hero in the story. I'm going to be the one standing outside the tomb with everybody else crying, going, no, 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 calm down. No need to cry. No need to cry. It's about to get better. Just wait. Let's, let's count down. Three, two, one. You know, I'm going to be the one who is confident the whole time Jesus is walking out of the tomb eventually. These disciples did not write themselves into the story as heroes. They actually documented their own doubts, fears, disbeliefs. Why would they do that? There's no other plausible explanation other than that's how it happened. These guys are willing to admit we did not believe until we saw Jesus with our own eyes. But when they saw him, it changed everything. And it has changed everything from that point forward. And it still changes everything for us. It still changes everything for us. Do you know why we have so much confidence that we have hope in the middle of difficulty? Do you know why we believe all the things we believe? Because Jesus is alive. Let me give you some examples. Do you know how we know that God is for us and that God hears our prayers? There's really only one reason. The reason we're confident that those things are true is because Jesus walked out of a tomb and he left it empty. And when a man predicts his own death and resurrection and pulls it off, you go with whatever he said. You can trust everything he taught. Do you know how we know this? Do you know how we know that suffering doesn't mean God has abandoned us? It feels that way to some of you, doesn't it? You know how we know suffering isn't a sign that God has abandoned us? Because Jesus suffered. And God did not abandon him. Do you know how we know heaven is real? Because the tomb is empty. This is why. We can trust everything Jesus said because he rose from the dead. I'll give you one more example. Do you know how we know that God loves you and God loves me? Not because the Bible tells us so. Not because there was a song that your mama sang to you when you were a kid, Jesus loves me, this I know. I mean, that's all great. We know God loves you and we know God loves me because Jesus told us that. And again, we can trust everything Jesus said because he rose from the dead. We can trust everything Jesus said because he predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off and it validated all of his teachings. That's how we know. That's how we can trust. That's why we have confidence. So, for some of you, you have doubted, you have wondered, You've had such a difficult time believing in the resurrection, and I get that. Here's what I would encourage and invite you to do. Would you just explore the evidence for yourself? I've only shown you a little bit of a mountain of evidence. Would you explore it for yourself? I'll tell you a couple ways you can do that. One, if you will message us directly through our Facebook page, email, through our website, whatever. If you'll message us directly, we'll point you in the right direction and give you some resources to explore. If you would join us online again next week, I'm going to start a brand new series called Aftermath. And the reason I'm doing this series, I'm not going to talk about what we should believe. I'm going to talk about what it means to believe. What is faith anyway? There's so much confusion around it. And I hope you'll track with us through this series. Because this Aftermath series might just clear a lot of the obstacles you have had to choosing to follow Jesus. For some of you, though, for some of you, you have discovered and experienced something today that you never knew before. And if I could put it into words for you, it's become clear to you that Easter isn't religious. Easter is historical, which means Easter is personal. The whole point of Easter is Jesus showing us that he loves us and he cares about us so much. He wants a personal relationship with us. So, as we close... If you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, you may know about God, you may believe in God, but it's not personal. Or if you've always wondered, and today you've realized, oh my goodness, I think this is true. What do I do with this now? I'll tell you what you do with it. You come to Jesus and you just tell him, thanks for doing everything you did for me so I could have a relationship with you. I want it, and I want it today. I can't think of a better day than Easter for you to start a relationship with your Heavenly Father. So, as we pray, I want to give you an opportunity to tell him that. Can we pray together? If you're ready to take that step to put your, 
your trust in Jesus, to accept his forgiveness, to begin a relationship with him. Just tell him in your own way, right there wherever you are in your mind, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe. I still have a lot of questions and a lot of doubts, but I'm not going to doubt your resurrection anymore. I believe you came out of that tomb. And because of that, I believe I can trust everything you said, including the fact that you died so I could be forgiven. We all need forgiveness. Including the fact that you died so I could be a part of God's family. Who doesn't want to be a son or a daughter of God? So I choose to believe. I choose to trust. If you're making that decision today, I would love for you to message us, again, through Facebook or email us from our website. Just let us know. We'd love to celebrate with you, and we'd love to give you some resources to help you know your next step. Father, we are so, so grateful because sometimes life makes us wonder, are you for us? Are you here? Do you care? Sometimes life makes us wonder if you love us. So thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Thank you for the reminder that we can have confidence and that we can have hope because that tomb is empty. Jesus was seen. There is evidence. And because of that, we can trust everything that he told us because he rose from the dead. We can trust and believe and have confidence in everything Jesus said was true because he is gone. He's gone. He's not still in a tomb. He's gone. And because he's gone, our sins can be gone. Because he's gone, our shame can be gone. Because he's gone, our guilt can be gone. God, thank you so much for that. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray all these things. Amen.